my purpose is to take the image that I have in here of the, how the universe works from, from the ultra small to the ultra big and us in the middle and, and project that out here with, with sound and pictures for you to be able to see what's in my head. You know, we're, as I say, we're in the middle of that spectrum. Well, it's kind of intuitively makes sense that here we are with this, this dimensionality and we can see things a certain degree bigger, a certain degree you know, further away, a certain degree smaller and further away on that scale. And uh, there was a very interesting look at that mathematically. If we look at the, the, the largest scale that we can see and that we can conceptualize, that we, we can interact with, it's called the Hubble sphere. Uh, so astronomer Hubble, you know, saying this is as far as we can ever see because if light is coming at us at the speed of light and the idea of, of an expanding universe, which may or may not be the case, but that's the current con conventional theory, it's not the only theory and it's not the one that we include as our, our preferred theory in the clinical theory of everything. We prefer, what Einstein preferred was a, 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 a steady state universe, a universe that's, that's infinite in time and space. And, and not expanding or contracting. Uh, and there's good evidence for that. The, the Hubble sphere is as far as we can see in space. So whatever's beyond that, there's no way for us to know, in, the, in our current paradigm, there's no, the theory says, there's no way that we can ever know if the universe is infinite or finite. We can only see this far. So it's cellular. It's, we can see the cell that we are at the center of. If we were at the edge of that cell, we'd see that same size cell over here. So, and, and so if the universe is infinite, we can't know. We can't prove that it is or it isn't. Uh, Einstein thought that, that it's a steady state universe, that it goes on forever, no beginning, no end, spatially or temporally. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the biggest. What's the smallest? is called the Planck scale. The, the, the smallest unit of, it's a unit of space, time, energy, so unit of everything, a Planck, is that one little dimensional unit that, that then theoretically makes up everything at bigger scales. And the, there's, there's this idea of looking at the, the platonic solids, that there's, there's five platonic solids that Plato contemplated, and, and only four were publicly taught. The fifth one, you had to be an initiate. You had to be studying, engaged studying with, with him to, to learn about. That was the, the, the most sacred, the highest form. And that was considered the, really the blueprint for, for everything, blueprint for creation. And that's the dodecahedron. There's, there's many interesting bits of support, supporting evidence even today for, for why that that may be the case. Uh, it's, it's obviously the platonic solids are, are, are the only completely regular, symmetrical, perfectly symmetrical geometric forms. So these are resonance forms. So if we think, consider the Planck unit as, say, a sphere, these are still the, the fundamental resonance uh, patterns within each of those units of space, time, and energy. And, and consciousness and information. So uh, <clears throat> the beauty is that if we go from the Planck scale to the Hubble sphere scale, we can ask the question on, on a mathematical basis, uh, on a geometric basis, like logarithmic basis of your mathematician, what's at the center of that spectrum? And it turns out are the center of our brainwave spectrum, the alpha rhythm, is exactly in the center of that spectrum. So here we are, and that's as far as we can see from, you know, from this hilltop of being human. <laughs> so once you see that, okay, it makes sense. Uh, and uh, let's move on to the next, next topic, next question.
So that says we're here in the center. Why? Because we're the observer. It's, it's kind of like before you know, the C Copernican revolution, the, the, the concept that the Earth is the center of the cosmos. Well, of course it is. It's the center of my cosmos because I'm the center of my cosmos and I'm on Earth. So here's, I'm on Earth and my perspective is not that I'm moving, but that, that the cosmos is moving around me. The stars and the sun and the planets and the moon all revolve around me. And so when I model that mathematically, we get complex epicycles and we can simplify those with the Copernican re revolution that says the sun is the center. But that doesn't mean that the sun is any more the center of the, the universe of creation than I am or the earth is. It's a center of perspective. So when we, today, when we launch a spaceship from earth, a rocket, a satellite, we don't use the Copernican mathematics. It would be way too complex to say, here we are on Earth, we're going to use mathematics that, say, that assumes the sun is the center. Or, you know, we could go further out and say the galactic center is the center, or the center of the galactic cluster, the supercluster, the center of the, 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 the uh, dark energy void that our, super, our galactic supercluster is on the cell membrane of. Again, it's all cellular, as above, so below. Uh, it's perspective, it's, it's perception, it's how we see things. And that's my view of in, within our clinical theory model, that's how we view relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity started with thought, thought experiments is how he described it. It's, you know, if I say, if I were traveling on a light beam, well, first of all, to speed my body up to the speed of a light beam, I'd ionize my body and I would not be conscious in the way I am now as a human being, I'd no longer have a human being body. So, so many of the, 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 the mathematics is wonderful and beautiful and, and, and it actually is useful because it describes the reality of perspective in space-time. That, that yes, if, if I'm here and you're there and something happens over there, uh, depending on the geometry or, or if two events happen, event A, event B, and depending on where we are in space, we may see A happen before B or B happen before A, and there's this whole notion of, of causality that uh, we have to tease apart a bit more because we know now there's studies that show reverse time causality. When you look at a slide presented by a computer, if it's an intense slide that creates an emotional reaction of like fear or disgust, that reaction is measurable before the slide is presented to your eyes. And in fact, before the computer creates a random number to generate that slide versus another slide. So time is not all that it appears to be in the linear conception of, of the arrow of time. It's no, no longer adequate to consider an arrow of time. We have to look at the vortex of time and say, yeah, well, the forward arrow is obvious. <laughs> We're living that, you know, from, from gestation to, to death. Um, but what's the reverse arrow of time? We know that, that the biocommunication from future time comes, is measurable coming from the heart, not from the brain. Where, where when we see the slide, our physiological responses come from the brain and, and, and go out to the heart. But there's more information flow from the heart to the brain than there is from the brain to the heart. So there's, again, more going on than initially meets the eye of linear Western scientific, rational, modern, conventional thought. So I model that the spirit operates in reverse time. It's not a new model. It's a, and, and most of the pieces of the clinical theory are not new. They're adopted from other views, other models, other, and other science. Uh, modern science for, for, for much of it. Uh, again, like, like these studies that support some other conceptions, like that the, the Egyptians saw time in a different way. They looked at space and time and they said, okay, space, time, they're different, but they probably work in, in a parallel way. So let's use it as an analogy. In space, it's obvious I can see what's in front of me. I move forward, I move into that that space that I, I can see. What's behind me, uh, I don't see clearly. What's in front of me, I do see. Here's where I'm coming from, that's where I'm going. 
So how does that work in time? What do we see clearly in time? We don't see the future clearly in time. We see the past clearly in time. So, so this was a different thought form, a different perspective, if you will, compared to the time-space perspective that we're, we're raised in now. It's a perspective that says, I must be coming from the future because I see the past clearly. I'm coming from over there, so I see this clearly. I'm coming from the future, I see the past clearly. And, and when, if we can get that, it gives us an image of who we are that transcends the sense of who I am as my ex life experience up to this point, which is growing and developing. I'm more now than I was a second ago or than I was a year ago or 10 years ago or when I was born or when I became a single cell. The Egyptian perspective on who we are and where we come from in time, being beings that come from the future, gives a wonderful perspective in this view that I'm talking about of the vortex of time. If we come from the future, from our perspective, you know, who, who am I ultimately is who I'm becoming. Who I will be is the fullness of myself, in the fullness of time. In an infinite future, if I continue becoming, I will ultimately, at the infinity point, I am who I truly am. And if I, who I am is perhaps not separate as I appear in the past perspective, which is the ego perspective, but I am one with all that is, then, then we are one as well. And so this is the view of us as cells, as living cells in the divine being of all creation. If we look at even how our body, mind, spirit functions of, with our senses, how we can see the stars. The body doesn't see the stars. The body can be alive or dead. When it's dead, it doesn't see anything. When the body's alive, it's not the body that's seeing, it's the spirit that's seeing through the body. The mi mind being a function of the spirit, which when the spirit is engaged in the body, when we're having an in-body experience, in this Occupy Myself movement, uh, <clears throat> we're seeing through the capacity, through the, the, the windows of our biological senses. When we have an out-of-body experience, a near-death experience, uh, a, a transcendent experience out of the body, our senses are different. They're, they're less limited. They're not limited by the physical body's receptivity to frequency, for example. Uh, <clears throat> I have a friend who, who died clinically several times and describes color on the other side, out of body, as being the best word to describe it being blue, but, but that not being in any way adequate, but it being uh, just color information that we don't, we're not able to sense in, in this body. I, it obviously had, had great meaning and, and some kind of a feeling tone, but the description was just the indescribable, but blue was the, the closest, <laughs> closest thing that it could say, uh, which is interesting. I mean, in, in terms of spiritual observations, uh, spirits that appear blue tend to be ben beneficent, beneficial, uh, positive spirits. Uh, there's an association of, of, of lower frequencies, lower energy levels of red, more with, with stress and danger. Uh, and in, in nature, red is a warning color. We see fire, we see animals that are poison. We'll use red as a warning color, as a defense. Uh, blood, fire, those are... I've had a, several patients in color therapy who experienced uh, uh, internally very stressful emotional like reaction of wanting to get away from a deep red color. That's actually the first color we see before we're born. We, we do see light. We, we know now that color vision is functioning at birth and before birth. It used to be thought that it, it wasn't because they didn't, the ways that they had of testing color vision maybe didn't show a behavioral response. But now we know that, that clearly it's working. And so the color experience in the womb is this ruby red, deep uh, deep red, near, close to in infrared type of frequency. 
long wavelength. And uh, so I had, had three people in my early years of practice who had an adverse reaction to that frequency. You know, I had indications from my testing, from vision testing, that this is a color that they're not absorbing, that they, they have a need for, they're deficient in it, they're not, they're not absorbing it. Um, and I found out through that kind of experience that sometimes that means there's a, a, a suppression of that. There's an association with, with, with stress and danger. It definitely uh, struck me when I found out in each case, you know, the first case was like, that was just the history. And the second case, like, oh, this is just like that other case. And then the third one was the absolute confirmation, like, this is a pattern that, oh, in every single case, there was actually fever, infection, uh, and trauma, surgery. In, in the womb, you know, when the, before they were born. So, uh, you know, they survived, but they were at, at risk for losing their life. And, and that association with fire is interesting in terms of the fever association and, and the, you know, the color in the womb being that, that color. Most of us, when we see that color in color therapy and syntonic optometry, will experience a visual pulsation, and it's from us, not from the light, but we have this pulsing experience in our vision. We have a sense of uh, psycho-emotional centering and relaxing uh, and uh, of being comforted and a sense of muscular, neuromuscular relaxation. So yeah, to have three people say, nah, let me out of here. <laughs> they you know, back up from the instrument. They, and, and they also, uh, people often feel like they're falling into it, even though it's horizontal. It's like, I feel like I'm falling into that light. Well, and that's kind of how we got here. <laughs> and how we leave, we go into the light, yes. What's 